Hey everyone, I have a, a great uh, special guest today. Thomas Solaro is here. How are you doing, Tom? I'm doing great, Dr. Berg. Thanks for having me on. Great. I'm, I wanted to catch up with you. A couple things. Number one, uh, you're coming to our summit to actually be one of the speakers, so that's going to be exciting. Yeah, I'm stoked. It's it's going to be great. You know, um, I've had uh, quite a few people sign up and uh, of you, people that follow you, and they're like, I just want to meet you. They want to meet you so in person. So you're going to see quite a few fans. They're going to line up and want to meet you, so it's going to be great. No, I'm um, looking forward to it. Yeah, so we have a lot of people sign up this year. We're going to go for 1,000. Last year was 500. So, And these are just the most wonderful people. It's just it's going to be a blast. So if you're watching now and you're considering coming, you may want to get signed up pretty quick because uh, I, I would hate to have people like find out it's like sold out and then like, oh, okay, I have to wait till next year. Um, so definitely uh, check it out. So um, yeah, let's let's talk. Uh, so lately, a lot of things are going in the news. I, I, you know, I always check in to see what video that you're releasing and things, and you know, because we actually are kind of on same same wavelength. Um, For sure. And there's a whole bunch of data on eggs, you know, and cholesterol. And um, so, do you have do you have anything interesting to comment on this egg thing? Yeah, I just put it. You know, I know you put a video up like a month or so ago when this first came out, and and. Uh, I feel like I was kind of beating a dead horse a little bit with this whole yeah. egg thing, but it's, I think one thing that just really needs to be out there is people understanding that it's not the cholesterol, it's the inflammation, that that's what we have to look at. And you right. can pick apart, they can pick apart any food they wanted to. Like I could, I could find a problem with broccoli. I could find a problem with cabbage. I mean, the, you can find a problem with any food. And when it's a cohort study like that, when things don't look at the big picture, it's very easy to just extract what you want to extract out of a study. And having been involved in clinical studies before and seeing them, it's the unfortunate thing is Dr. Berg, and you, you know this, and it's unfortunately it breaks, it breaks down a lot of people is knowing that clinical studies aren't always the gospel. <laughs> no, no, no you're, and it's, I totally agree. It's the amount of corruption. I mean, you know, like, like I, I just did a video on this recently. Um, apparently, and I it, there's a rule that was passed, I think, in 2005 that they I don't I don't think they follow this, but you have to be transparent. You have to upload all the studies that you actually do, including the ones that don't turn out that well, the, the ones that have complications. But into I guess it's a clinicalstudies.gov. Don't quote me, but the point is that before 2005 they could cherry pick what studies they want to put up. And uh, so you're getting this altered uh, so-called facts. Um, and I mean, one thing they can do, they can actually filter out the first six weeks yep. of data. Yep. So, you know, you can't, you can't always go by these studies. I mean, it's insane. Well, in the first, sometimes, I mean, it's, it's, I've heard that before that you can filter out the first six to eight weeks. And the fact is the first six weeks, sometimes that's, for both positive and negative, that's a really important period of time. Like people have radical shifts yeah. in so many different important markers in those first six weeks, and a lot can happen in six weeks, a lot of good and bad. And, you know, of course, the body's going to come back to whatever homeostasis it is, but the whole purpose of them kind of being able to take away that first six weeks, at first, I thought it was put in place out of good, uh, good faith. I thought maybe, okay, maybe they're trying to get rid of the impulse response that happens with the body sometimes, you know, a massive right. course correction. I mean, if someone goes on keto, they're going to have massive, well, potentially reductions in inflammation within the first few weeks, just because it's a big shock to their system and their body's coming into a whole new world. Um, and then it can kind of balance out sometimes, but most of the time, how quickly someone adapts to something is a very good indicator of how their lifestyle was before. So I think it's very good information that should be included in the study and also rounds out what the ultimate conclusion is of that study. Um, and what do you do with studies that are 10 weeks long? That means you only have four, right. four weeks of aggregate data. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Give me a break. I mean, even the, um, one of the things that they, um, they have listed of it's basically non-compliance, and so if you look at what they mean by non-compliance, uh, it's all mostly side effects. So you're like you eliminate all the side effects. Okay, so, and I don't know how much of the how much of this is like diet related. I think it's I'm mainly talking about more of the drug studies that they do. Yeah, 
which you, I think you, you were in that field for a while. So. Yeah, I was. Yeah. And that's, that's a really gnarly world. So I was in the, you know, the lab services world. So, you know, we were kind of some of the first that were doing like the old ZRT cortisol salivary testing and stuff like that way back in the day when it was just concierge doctors doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was interesting seeing, cause we were in direct competition with the organizations that were just trying to go for maximum reimbursement, you know, so we were working with like, I mean, you're familiar with concierge medicine, obviously it's very similar to chiropractic and stuff that's in the, um, the medical side. So it's just, whereas doctors that were generally working with patients on a fee for service basis, not based on insurance reimbursable. So that being said, a lot of the doctors that I was working with were very invested in keeping their patients happy and doing the right thing. Because if they weren't getting good patient outcomes, they weren't getting paid because it was the affluent patients that were paying them directly. Whereas we were working, you know, the other side of the equation were the doctors that were just going for the jugular with whatever they could and maximum reimbursement. So then you have doctors that will lobby for specific drugs, depending on what the reimbursement's going to be on it. It's like, Oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> it's, it's wow. sick, man. It really is. Sick. Insane. Yeah. Insane. You know, um, one one really touchy subject that I, I haven't done a lot of videos on and I probably won't for various reasons, but, um, and I don't want to get too into it, but vaccinations, yeah. um, you know, it's the only thing I want to say about it is, and then I'll shut up, but you have, um, people say, oh yeah, it's safe, but over $4 billion were spent on the um, vaccine courts. Yeah. So you have vaccine court, like, wait a second now. If you are on a psych drug, they don't have a psych drug court. It's like, but you have a vaccine court. Like, and apparently they don't even have judges. They have like uh, health and services employees. I'm like, what? And then, um, so you have this situation where it's like, interesting, interesting data that you're, yeah, you know. Um, so I think um, as as time goes on, more more things will pop up on that. But uh, I do know that certain friends of mine that had have quite a large YouTube channels. Um, they had some of their social media taken away because they talked a little too much about that. So, you know, it's just an area that I'll probably stay away from right now, but you know, people always ask me and I, I just like, well, you do the research, you know, it's uh, look, just look into why, why they have the vac vaccination courts and then also uh, how much is paid out. And then of course we have to, the drug companies don't pay that. We have to pay it. Taxpayers pay that. I'm like, what the heck is up with that? So, yeah. you know, it's, you have studies, you have the data, uh, but I think you need to personally experience some of these, these things yourself to see if it works for you. And then you'll really know. Agreed. Agreed. And, and, you know, back to the original topic at hand, which was the, the egg study, or it wasn't, I shouldn't even call it the egg study. I mean, I was right. calling it the egg study. It was like the eggs are just like this cherry picked portion of it. The fact was, is, You've touched on it. I've touched on it. They ask these patients once if they consumed eggs, uh, you know, and, and that's like asking, it's going up to a, like a 16 year old and asking if they consume a Snickers bar. And it's like, it, it, they, if they said no, they'd be lying. But if they said yes, they're going to assume they eat it every day. That's not very fair. I mean, that's kind of backing someone into a corner. So you can at the very, and I have a video that hasn't gone live yet talking about the skipping breakfast study. There was another study that came out that said skipping breakfast is correlated with increased risk of CBD and all this stuff. Right. And it's, uh, if you haven't, if you haven't seen the whole thing, I'll send you the link, but it's, it's just, and, and the way that I even opened my video on that, I was talking about, okay, like literally by saying that, like you're putting someone into a corner just by how you frame the question. So for example, Dr. Burke, if I say, uh, Dr. Burke, do you skip breakfast? The word skip in its very nature is implying that if by skipping breakfast, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> Whereas if right. I were to say, Dr. Burke, do you eat breakfast or not? You have right. a whole different question. So right. just by right. how it's phrased in the study itself, even in the abstract, skip, skip breakfast. So you can tell that they're, they're, they're putting people on edge. So if someone comes wow. to me and says, you skip, do you skip breakfast? And I'm you know, someone that's intimidated because I'm in a clinical setting and I'm not familiar, don't know how to navigate the world. I'm just saying, like, of course, someone's going to put me in a corner. I'm going to say, no, I don't skip breakfast. Like, no, I'm not supposed to skip breakfast. I don't skip breakfast. <laughs> How, do you neglect your breakfast? <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, that's just crazy. So you're talking about the questionnaire studies that they do? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I remember. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, I mean, and, and those have a those have a valid place, but we can't take 
questionnaire studies and really try to extrapolate like concrete clinical evidence that's going to dictate what we eat and don't eat. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's just not fair. And all the studies that, and the other thing we have to look at is the skipping breakfast study. What they don't mention in the primary portion of the study that you have to dig deeper in those that skipped breakfast also mm-hmm. happen to be generally smokers, mm-hmm. drinkers, and chronic drinkers, and those that had un- uh, other unhealthy lifestyle habits. So it's like, that's not to say everyone that skips breakfast does, but there's a big, big difference between consciously skipping breakfast because you're fasting or you're playing around with time-restricted eating and just forgetting breakfast because you're not paying attention to what you eat or what you don't eat. You right. know, there's a lot of people that get up in the morning and then just like breakfast isn't even a thought because they're just stressed out and they're going through their day and they're it's it's no fault of their own, but they're just they're just going through life and they're not thinking about it. Then there's the people that have maybe watched our videos and have seen this and are like, oh, well, I'm consciously going to skip breakfast. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to make sure that I get my greens and make sure I get my nutrients within my respective eating window. Big difference between skipping breakfast and that. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you um you have uh, a small boy, right? I mean, he's how old? Is he one years old or how old? He's, is he? he's 18 months now. He's growing too months. fast. I need to wow. slow him down. How, how do I wow. slow him down? <laughs> You know, if I had the answers to that, I would probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. No. Um, <laughs> so we have a we have a little baby in the house, uh, five months, Lucy. So, um, so we're similar, my granddaughter, and so she, we're doing cod liver oil every morning, just a little bit, and um, of course breastfed, and talk about like robust cheeks and just body, and like the, the teeth. I mean, teeth are coming in now, but everything's just coming out perfect. So. Um, what what do you, what did you guys do with your child? Did you did your wife breastfeed and? Uh... So, yeah, so he was uh, so my wife was keto when we got pregnant. Um, she went through a period of, during her pregnancy. She went through a period of time where she she thought it was wise to bring in some low glycemic carbohydrates just to introduce a little bit of everything. And then the third trimester, she went back strict keto. Um, baby was born healthy and very big. My wife is a, not a large woman. She's uh, five two, five three, about one hundred and fifteen pounds, and the baby was. Uh, over nine pounds. So it was the big boy. Wow. And it was like, okay, how did this happen? So, <laughs> um, so then, yeah. So I mean, the funny thing is you said cod liver oil. So cod liver oil is, we give it to him in the evening. So I was going to ask you slight digression. Is there a reason that you give him cod liver oil or her cod liver oil in the morning versus evening, or is it just the best time in general? Oh, um, not any specific time. Okay. We, we do sure it probably reason. in the evening. Um, okay. You know, she's, she's still, uh, you know, breastfeeding probably several times a day yeah um, but she just that baby is hungry so we gotta like yeah. so we're, we're doing the egg yolk uh cooked of course just egg yolk and then um with the cod liver and that seems to i mean lucy just sucks it up just you know yeah she likes it um she's learning how to swim um just really happy baby no problems no health issues you know i I always get, I'm sure you probably get questions about kids too with, you know, what do I do for this? What, they're always sick. You know, we don't, we don't have that situation. Yeah. yeah. Tommy in the 18 months, you know, he's been sick. You know, he got sick really bad over his first birthday. And I think it was just because his immune system was crushed because he had four molars coming in at one time. <laughs> or I'm sorry, the canine and three molars or so. He had one coming in and the other one was coming in later. And I think it just crushed his immune system. I mean, yeah. that's a lot, you know, so his little sinuses where he's just all inflamed and, um, but you know, he's just had, other than that, you know, like one other little cold and it's just, I mean, he's a, he's a good baby. Um, what I noticed when Amber was breastfeeding was that there was a period of time where she kind of tested it where she wasn't keto and the breast milk, when it would go in the fridge, the fat that would come to the top was about yay big, maybe like a centimeter versus when she would go back in keto. And then we would actually refrigerate and whatever she was pumping. I'm kidding you not. Eric, it was like an inch of fat that would float to the top. Wow, fascinating. The overall volume of liquid was less, I would say. And that makes sense because probably in a slight state of, I don't want to say dehydration, but just less fluid just because you're keto. And, but I was so amazed, like net, net calorie content had to have been doubled just because the amount of fat was twice as much. Wow. So like he would latch and he had a little bit of an issue with latching because he had a, um, it's called, you know, you're familiar with the tongue tie. So he had a tongue tie where the, the tongue, basically that little flap of skin that holds the tongue to the bottom of the mouth um, was a little bit too large or it was just fastened a little bit too close to the end of the tongue. So he was having a hard time latching. So we were concerned that he wasn't getting enough nutrients, but here this kid was growing like a weed. And the fact that Amber was on keto, he didn't have to consume nearly as much milk. 
it, just because the fat content was so high. So it was wow. Yeah, it was it was really interesting. Fascinating. Uh, now, how long did she breastfeed for? So she breastfed for about seven months before her supply started to go, and that's you know. So we were like, okay, well, what do we do? Because we were really because we don't like formula, we don't, but then we actually did find. Um, we were like, okay, if we we can do. Pea is a little hard to digest, but they do make a goat milk formula, which is A2 casein. So if you if people out there do have to supplement and it does happen, go with like a goat milk formula or something that's A2. Do not, and this is, okay, I mean, I can't give parental advice. I'm not, haven't been a dad long enough, but come on, like that, the, the formulas that are out there, like you can get a goat milk formula. I think the one we used was Holly, mm -hmm. an organic goat milk. So it's A2 casein. Um, those of you that aren't familiar with A2, A1, A2 is the beta casein that is not, uh, doesn't have nearly as many inflammatory linkages to it, and it also doesn't have the um, the high opioid level that's basically the opioid response level that typical A1 does. So mm -hmm. not addictive because little babies get they don't realize it, but they get addicted to formula. So, oh my gosh, it's just insane. So so you um, you started to enhance the diet, and then did you do you actually do solid foods as well? Oh yeah, yeah. No, he's yeah. he's he's been on solid food. We did. Uh, you familiar with baby led weaning? No. Um, so baby led weaning is where you you let them start to have solid food at a pretty young age, like six months. You just start letting them kind of mm -hmm. like pick at it, and you just monitor them closely. And uh, you know, so by the time he was eight months, he was you know eating solid food. So we figured, okay, if if the supply is you know not as great as we want it to be, let's get them on solid food as much as we can. And you know, everything that we were diving into research wise, was saying you know the only reason. He, you continue to either a breastfeed or formula feed or milk feed if the baby's not getting enough nutrients. And our baby was, he was eating. I mean, you know, the funny thing, his favorite food was broccolini, like baby broccoli. So he was just devouring that stuff. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's, well, it's, it, these babies can adapt. I mean, they, they're going to quickly develop what they need to, to digest that food. Um, I think the the big challenge that I think we're going to have is other relatives and that, you know, like we're going to bring Lucy somewhere to a party or something, all the other garbage, because it's really hard to get everyone in my entire environment to be on page with that. So, you know, last thing I'm going to do is have some of these, you know, these parties where they have all the sugar and, and then start that. Yeah, I'm going to try to avoid it as much as possible. I want, I want her to be a keto, uh, keto baby yeah. as long as possible. Agreed. Agreed. And it's, it's, it's a bummer because, I mean, it's, I try to keep it out of my mind, but it's a reality that as kids get older, they're going to be exposed to these things. And the only thing that you can do is teach them that the way that you're teaching them to eat not necessarily is the right way, but make it fun. And if they feel good, there's going to be a simple Pavlovian response where they go and they have that garbage food and they're not going to feel good. Right. And, you know, I, I can't be the dad that's saying like, you go to Jimmy's house and you don't, you dare eat that, you know, you're going to breed resentment and it's just not going to work. But I know that if right. he goes to Jimmy's house and he has a pop tart that he's going to come home and he's going to say, dad, I don't feel so good. Right. <laughs> I don't, I I don't want to eat that again. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to use too much force, but I do want to educate them. What I do with my kids is I, I showed them a couple of videos on um, just foods in general. One was actually about GMO foods. And I did see when they were probably like six or seven, they, this shift. So they're like, you know what? The, you, you see the, you know, the point where now they can, I'm going to start avoiding that versus me telling what to eat. So yeah. I think it's a self-determined thing that they have to eventually, you know, have a light bulb go off. And of course, if you use too much force, they're just going to do the opposite. And then they're going to go, okay, I'll just do this despite you. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. no, exactly. But I mean, it's, it's so fun to watch and it's so fun to see um, just everything click and knowing that you know this high DHA diet that you know my baby's eating is is working and I I'm not one to ever like try to compare to others but I see his development compared mm -hmm. to a lot of others and I'm just like wow okay it's a boat of confidence for me I mean we're doing something right if if I fail at everything else I'm doing in life right now I know that at least I think we're doing something right here and it's uh it's so amazing. And that was one of the, you know, one of the key supplements that my wife took throughout pregnancy was, you know, like high dose of DHA, docosahexaenoic acid, you know, whether it be from calamarine, whether it be from some forms of krill, um, algal oil, we rotated them up. And I think that that made a really big, big change. I really think it did. Oh and yeah. Brain development. Yeah. Uh, eye, optic nerve. Um, do you find that, um, um, 
What about nutritional yeast? Did you use that at all? We haven't used it with, with him. I mean, I'm, a, I'm practically addicted to this stuff. I put it on everything. If I see my video where I put, always put it, like my favorite is putting it in nutritional yeast with a little bit of coconut oil or I'm sorry, putting it with asparagus with a little bit of coconut oil, mm. mixing it up. And I mean, that tastes amazing. Um, but I haven't done any, anything with him in nutritional yeast. However, he, I mean, he eats the asparagus that I make with nutritional yeast and devours it. But I haven't done any specific yeah. protocols or anything like that. Now, when you were a kid, did you, were you a junk food junkie or did you, were you raised really healthy in the very beginning? And then what, what happened? What did you eat? Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, my mom was, was hard on us kids in a really interesting way. Um, like I ran my first marathon when I was 11 years old, um, wow. which was probably too young to run a marathon, but you know, my mom's always about pushing us and it was interesting. I think it, it raised my sister, raised my sister and I in a very unique way. Um, so it was interesting, like from what I recall with my childhood, it was, it was definitely not a junk food junkie at all, but there would be random things that my parents would be wildly opposed to and random things that they would allow. Like I, I do remember going to McDonald's and getting McChicken sandwiches somewhat frequently. But then I also remember hearing that cornflakes, which weren't even sweetened, were like abstain from them at all costs. Don't ever touch a cornflake. So there was just these weird mixed messages that I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm allowed to go get a McChicken, but I can't, you know? <laughs> so right. it was right. like these weird personal biases that were just getting kind of put onto us with no real rhyme or reason. But I learned at a really young age, because I took a, a took a real interest in just my blood work by the time I was like 13 years old. I was really interested in things. I, I started working out and I had a friend that was a doctor and, or his friend whose dad was a doctor. And I, I got some blood work done for some routine thing. And I started getting like really interested in like what makes the body tick. And I remember seeing that my, I remember vividly my middle school cross country coach telling me that um, his triglycerides were high. And this was like a super healthy guy. And then I remember looking at my lab results for some reason and finding that my triglycerides are high. I was like, well, triglycerides, like, I'm a thin runner. Like, what's going on? And it just, so it was at that very point in time where I started learning about, okay, well, you could be a seemingly healthy person, very athletic person, and high, have a high storage form of fat that's not actually depositing as adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I remember freaking out being like, I'm fat on the inside. I'm actually, I'm fat on the inside, but I'm just not fat. And <laughs> so... I developed this sort of interest in it. And then I, what's really interesting is I remember um, my parents were divorced after about you know, 13, 14 years old. And I remember I used to go to dinner with my dad um, a couple times per week or one time per week. And I remember I used to feel so much better if I, if I would go with my dad, we'd go out to pizza. But I always found that if I just abstained from food throughout the course of the day, that I didn't bloat as much when I ate the pizza. And so it was funny. I look back and I'm like, oh my gosh, I was intermittent fasting at 14 years old. And didn't that is know. hilarious. I just felt better. Granted, I was breaking my fast with pizza, but oh, I was like, I feel so much better the day after I eat. It was wild. So, Interesting. Yeah. Well, I saw uh, your picture that you have posted um, in some of the videos as well. You, you were very large at one time. Yeah. You hit, yeah. What, what was it like? Was it close to 300? Yeah, it was about 200, 285 pounds. So that was, so I went from being super athletic in high school and a little bit of college to getting into the corporate world. I was in corporate healthcare and I was a physician recruiter. And honestly, I just, I cut my lifting down from four days, five days per week down to like one day per week. And it was just, it, it quite frankly, doctor, it was like a, it was kind of a bulk gone wrong. Like it was like, I started being like, I want to put some muscle on and then just stop worrying about the gym portion altogether. Cause I was focused on making money in my career and okay. yada, yada. And you know, next thing I know is really six, seven months later, I'm looking at myself being like, I'm a shell of the person I used to be like, what the heck is going on? Um, you know, so it's, I wasn't overweight for a really long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, but what made it really interesting was that I had experience. I was, I looked like the, uh, the, the football coach that just kind of just let himself go. They used to play football and then just stop playing football and just continue to eat like that. I, I, like I was a decently muscled person, but I was just sloppy. And, and what, what, what age was that? So I was, I was young. I was 22. So it was 22. like, I was way too young. And then, you know, so it wasn't until, you know, I was already pre-diabetic at 22. I went from being seemingly pretty darn healthy to gaining a ton of weight and my CRP levels were off the charts. I was in the healthcare world. So, I mean, I had access to amazing physicians and everything else. So right. fortunately I was at a young age, which I think, um, thank goodness I was at a young age because I was able to bounce back and recover and get my head on straight. And I'm, I was fearful that, you know, if that had gone on for another 10 years, 
uh, could have been really serious. You know? Wow. Interesting. Yeah, I, I was, uh, I was very, very thin, did the whole wrestling thing in college. And, um, then, um, you know, I'm like, you know, I need to gain some weight. So I started eating potatoes. <laughs> and, uh, at first I was trying like just milk, fat, cheese, butter. And I noticed I was trying to, I was getting skinnier. This was actually in San Diego. And I'm like, well, that didn't work. So I started doing potatoes and I did not gain any weight until I hit like 28 years old. And then it was started to putting a little pizza crust around my waist at 28. So, but I, I didn't, you know, get extremely weight, uh, overweight. But the, the point is that I started having a combination of inflammatory problems, probably similar mm -hmm. to you. I started noticing arthritis in my fingers and my back and uh, got so bad where uh, I actually was living, um, I don't know where I was at the time, but I flew to Bernard Jensen, remember mm -hmm. him? Yep. Uh, he was the colon hydrotherapy genius guy. So I go out there, I visit him because I, I figure, well, maybe he knows what's wrong with me. And I said, I waited all day to see what was wrong. And I said, I stand in line and I said, what is going on? Because look at my eyes. They're all bloodshot, the inside of the eyelids. And he looked at me and he just said, I don't know. I'm like, <laughs> wow, I came all the way out here. <laughs> I thought you were going to solve all my problems, right? So um, that was just a severe hypoglycemia. Um, it was bad blood sugar problems, high insulin. I was inflamed. And um, I was in San Diego at the time, and I was driving down the street, and I said, honey, let's, this is the health house. Let's go see the health house. It's just like yellow building. So we go in there. This guy had all these protein, protein pills and raw milk. And so I started that, and he had us back in his backyard working out. Like all these things, I, was, I remember I was just searching so desperately to try to find what was wrong. And then I just happened to stumble on this book, um, Mastering the Zone. Um, and I started reading this thing about insulin. I'm like, what? I studied this in school, but didn't really click. So I, um, I started eating Buffalo burger for breakfast and I'm like, and no more life cereal. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, do I feel good? So I started to go, Karen, this is it. This is amazing. You know, so I, I just dove right in head first. She, and I, um, I said, I'm, I want to actually, I don't want to do chiropractic anymore. She goes, what? What do you want to do? I said, I want to do nutrition. She goes, you don't know anything about it. I said, I'm going to learn. So I said, you're okay. So you're going to quit chiropractic and get a nutrition. I said, yep. So here I am in the, basically in our library or actually our, our living room studying and trying to learn and going to postgraduate seminars and stuff. And that's kind of how it started, but it was out of desperation for just straight, trying to figure out this inflammatory condition and the severe insomnia and all that stuff. I think, I think most people that I know, even when, when I did the last summit, like no one really gets into this unless they have a personal health crisis. I don't know. Do you know, do you know of anyone that got into it? Because, well, I'm already doing good. I think I just want to go do, be, do keto. Yeah. I mean, the only time that I see that is people that are in um, the biohacking world that might want an additional tool, but there's no real call to action there. It's more so just, Oh, well, you tell me that I can, you know, heighten my cognitive function and do this. So there is a small subset there, but yeah, there's almost always a call to action. And yeah. like my call to action was, um, I was, you know, I was in the healthcare world and I was the epitome of being unhealthy. Like it was just, and so it, it, I had a, just a connection at that point where I'm going, Oh my gosh. Okay. Like this is a perfect example of what is wrong with our healthcare system, but also what is wrong with me. Right. And so, I mean, for me, it was, it was that. It was like, I want to do yeah. the opposite of what I'm doing now, but in the same vein of helping people. <laughs> and, right. uh, and, as, you know, and then there was the side mission of, okay, well, I've already lost this weight. Now I want to get in really good shape and see how far I can take this and kind of a personal mission. And then my next step was I realized that the fitness industry was extremely unhealthy. And like the fitness industry is like artificially healthy, <laughs> you know, they, right. like fluorescent powders and, and whatever it takes to look a certain way for a finite period of time and then not really think about their health. I'm like, boy, oh boy, is there a gap that needs to be bridged here uh, where you can actually apply true health principles to fitness. <laughs> right. It's a new concept. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I mean, out of desperation, I, I remember going into um, a room with patients and they're complaining about some symptom and thinking, 
if they only knew how effed up I was. I mean, here I was. I, here, like, I'm coming out of, I haven't, I haven't slept for four days. I just can't sleep. I'm chronically fatigued. I have arthritis, and they're complaining. I'm like, I should be the patient, you know? So this, there was that little secret that I didn't want anyone to know about. And then things started turning around. But um, yeah, it was um, out of, I mean, even in like chiropractic college, I remember we lived in this house, all these caros, um, and we would um, have deep fry night, like three times a week. Mm -hmm. And not just healthy deep fry night, right? It was, no, it was Crisco. It was like, we would do that. And then we would do... Um, um, meatloaf with, I mean, like just constantly carved out to the extreme. And I remember um, having severe right shoulder pain and going, what is that coming from? You know, it was the gallbladder it was completely inflamed. So I think out of all the people that I've ever met, I think I've had every single symptom that everyone complains about. So I think that's how I, that helped me relate to people. I'm like, oh, you, you have that? Oh, I have that too. So it's good and bad at the same time. But I think for me, if I never went through that, I would never push myself to learn some of the stuff that I'm into right now. Would, would you? No, no, definitely. Well, I mean, there's people always comment in my videos that, oh, you've got such a, like an energy. In it. That's because there's the passion is there because every time I learn something, I'm applying it to my own regimen right. and I'm right. learning it so that I can be better too. So the funny thing is, is here I am an online authority like you and but i'm learning as i go too and it, that's what's great like i are sure i have a foundational knowledge and there's a lot of things that i've learned and have a, built a great repository of clinical studies and information but like i learn and i love sharing and when you see the passion in a specific video where you're like oh thomas is really heated or he seems really amped up about this that's because there's genuine excitement because i just learned something that i'm applying to my life now and seeing a result and i know you're the same way and it's like whether I'm not just going to like regurgitate something that's boring to me. Like I'm going to stick within the vein of what I'm passionate and excited about and where I've been and where I've been able to see a change in my life because I know that my viewers have expressed the same issues and concerns, you know, whether it's going to be inflammation based or whether it's going to be fat loss based or workout based. I, I know where they're coming from because even though I was only there for a short amount of time, I've been there. And right. it's so it's uh that's what's fun. That's, that's why I love, I love what I do now. And I know you do too. It's just, uh, I can't ever imagine being back in that, uh, you know, corporate junkie position. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I'm actually doing exactly what I want to do. Like every day I like to research. I like to figure out mysteries of things and I like to educate people and uh, I could just keep doing that. And I do a lot of that, but um, yeah, it's fun. And um, you know, my wife says, don't you even want to read anything else? I'm like, uh, no, I'm, aren't you interested? I'm like, no, I'm interested. Like, I have this new, here's a book right here I'm reading right now. Oh, this thanks. Natural Products and Drug Discovery, an Integrated Approach. So, first of all, like this, it's a, a, a book written um, by Indian doctors about all of the natural remedies that drug companies get their ideas from. I mean, this is like pure gold. And I'm yeah. just going into like, these herbs and the history of the, how the, the anti-inflammatory signals. But, um, and of course, you know, I'll explain everything to my wife and she's like, okay, can we talk about something else? Yeah. <laughs> she's appreciative that I'm at least uh, someone's into it. But uh, unfortunately though, some of these books are, this was like $150. I'm like, you can't just go and get them for $29. So some of the, these really technical books filled with gold, sometimes you have to be willing to, you know, but, you know, I'll, I'll have three ideas for right off the bat for videos that I'll do just the research on yeah. like they have, if a drug company takes a property off of a garlic extract, um, they're going to invest a lot of money in something like that for, because obviously it must work. So I want to know all about it. Yeah. So that's fascinating. Yeah, no, that is fascinating. And, uh, you know, well, I know you've got your, um, you know, electrolyte blend and everything like that. I'm sure you've read, have you read this book? This is actually one that, uh, the salt fix, Dr. Janik. Have you seen that? You know, I, I have that in a Kindle. It's yeah. a very interesting book. I like it. Really, really interesting book. And when you apply it, it's some, a lot of the things that he talks about, Dr. Janik talks about are just exacerbated uh, on a keto diet in a positive way. I mean, it's just like the impact of, um, so that's just, that's been my recent uh, 
you know, uh, nerd outlet. I'm always, I always have at least one or two nerd outlets going at a specific time. Absolutely. So, so um, what are, what are, what's a good takeaway that you want to um, tell people about that book that you kind of just, just you know, learned? Generalized. I mean, I did a video on it and some people saw it. Uh, there's one thing called the, the NST receptors, which is a wild, wild world. Like basically um, they now find that salt and being deprived of salt or being deficient in sodium, literally if someone, okay, it's put it, better to put it in an analogy or an example. If you were deficient in salt or you're on a keto diet and you're not getting enough salt and you're not salting your food with good, healthy salt um, and you were craving salt, well, salt is the one thing that our bodies inherently know to get when we are deficient in it. Hence why livestock directly know how to go to a salt lake. It's really wild. And I was like, oh my gosh, that just clicked. Like, like we've got horses. So we know, like we can put any color salt brick in the middle of the pasture and they will go to it because we know like sodium is that critical to our function. Mm -hmm. But what's really wild is in human studies, if you give a human something sweet when they're deficient in salt, it's going to satisfy the same receptor that would have been satisfied if they had salt. So what that means is that we have signals that get crossed that make it like, so on keto, like if someone does start getting cravings, the first thing I say is increase your salt because the, the signals are getting crossed and you might be you're craving something sweet because you're really craving salt. And they do that and they're like, oh my gosh, like the salt craving's gone. <laughs> it's, I, wonder, I wonder if that's why a lot of people crave salt and sugar at the same time. It, I'm sure it is. It's, it's a combination of that plus, of course, the hyper palatability. That's just not a natural. It's the same thing why um, fats and carbs together are so interesting. Like I think there was one study, I actually just saw it the other day. It's an older study, but like you look at, uh, took subjects that would say, they'd give, show them a picture of carbs and then they'd show them a picture of uh, meat and fat. And then they'd show them a picture of like a pastry where it combined and the uh, salivary response and everything of the combined fats and carbs, because it's not something that would really occur in nature. Like we wouldn't really very seldom do you have things that are naturally high in fat and carbs at the same time. Very few. You don't have a whole lot of that. And it's uh, so I think there's a couple, there's the hyper palatability, there's the signals getting crossed. I mean, I'm not a neuroscientist, but that, that whole world fascinates me. <laughs> That's, that's interesting because I'm, I'm kind of like the same way. Like I'll, I'm, I'm really, right now I'm into vitamin D hardcore. So I'm just, I can't get enough information on vitamin D, but I'll, I'll kind of go rotate into different areas, but vitamin D, and I'll just kind of touch on it just because it's, it's like every single immune cell has a receptor for vitamin D mm -hmm. and you have this cell called the neutrophil and it's, it is basically an assassin. It's one of your soldier immune cells that gets triggered by vitamin D. And it has many different strategies. Uh, one is it has enzymes that basically will kill bacteria, it eats bacteria, but it has this, uh, this net structure that's about 25 times its size that it throws over um, bacteria and viruses. And, uh, and then it releases free radicals and enzymes and then it just explodes. It actually explodes like a little popper mm -hmm. and kills the thing. Yeah, they're suicide bombers. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm yeah. like, fascinating. So when you're vitamin D deficient, uh, they don't they don't work. They don't work that well. So it really brings up brings your defenses way down, makes you susceptible. So I am just like, this could be a science fiction, I mean, sci-fi movie, like incredible, just about what happens inside your body. And um, like even with vitamin D, there's four mutations that people can have. So if you have a mutation, you're not going to absorb vitamin D and you can get these tested genetically. And so you're, you got to take either take more or you can do other things as well to increase the absorption, like take bile salts. But uh, I mean, especially with even breastfeeding uh, a mother that's breastfeeding, if they don't take some additional vitamin D, it's really out of all the nutrients, that one is the, the hardest to achieve, uh, just regular foods, because it's not really, you know, it's like sunshine, but it's not in a lot of foods unless you're doing common oil. Yep. I mean, That's maybe a yep. little bit of mushrooms, but I think mushrooms is uh, D2. Yep. But yeah, just, you've got to be able to have that active conversion. And that's, yeah. and cod liver oil, that's exactly why I'm a huge proponent of it too, because it's the bio, bioavailable, you're not looking synthetic. Yeah. And the same thing, um, not to digress, but I mean, the vitamin A, D combination that you get yes. with cod liver oil, the, the retinol A, the true bioavailable form that actually has what are called pro-resolving mediators. I mean, it's like that whole world and you're, you're, you're 
totally dead on. You, you can't really get vitamin D from really good food sources. And the egg supply that we do, would normally get vitamin D from, I mean, that's, that's, it's negligible, to be completely honest. And, right. But then everything you're saying about you know, the, the T cell and the di- vitamin D receptors and everything, it makes sense why we get so, so sick in the wintertime when we have less sun exposure and we're not, it's, uh, yeah, we could, we should, we could have a whole series on this where we could probably drive people crazy with, uh, with this stuff for, for six hours oh, at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I wanted to just uh, chat with you a little bit. I, I know your time, you're, you're probably got to get back to studies and, or your family right now, but I wanted to touch base and just um, collaborate a little bit. And uh, also just tell people that you are going to be at the event coming at the end yeah. of August 29th, and we're going to have a blast. And um, so for, you, for, for those of you that are watching, you, you, should, you should definitely sign up. I'll put a link down below. And we can't wait to meet you guys. So definitely. Thomas, thank you so much for this interview. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely do more. Definitely. It was uh, nice to touch base. Absolutely. And, and yeah, it's, I mean, literally at your event, it's probably the only time uh, in the foreseeable future that people are going to be able to uh, be with Dr. Berg and Thomas DeLauer at the same time. So exactly. <laughs> and we've, got a, world. We've, got, we've got a lot of mutual followers and uh, you know, everyone that follows my channel is a huge fan of yours. And uh, so uh, I'll do whatever I can to help, uh, you know, spread, spread the word. But, Excited to see a lot of people there. Because well, I'm because I'm tracking the who's signing up, and I had I had you know several people. Um, I don't know if it was a group or something, but my staff um, always surveys like what why why do you want to come? Well, we want to meet that just uh, Tom. We want to meet Thomas. Yeah, you know I mentioned it. So you know what it was? I mentioned it. It was right after you reached out to me. I just mentioned it in a simple live broadcast, and it was like a subtle mention. It was just like, yeah, I'm going to be at Dr. Berg's event. And, you know, so I think that might have been a little cluster of people that came from just from that little live broadcast. So, um, yeah, I don't want to, you know, as you know, it's like I don't want to just like put it out to my audience. And if, but I mean, I'm happy to if, if we spread the word more, but I also don't want, I know you're limited on seats, so I don't want to like have both of us blow it up too much and have people miss out and like that. So Right, exactly. We'll, we'll just invite the people that we, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Everyone can come. Everyone can come. So, yeah.